Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Potter. Thank you very much, Professor Vasilyev, for uh, bringing me here. It's uh, always a pleasure to be uh, in Monterey, and though I, I say it in uh, various audiences throughout this week, it's definitely always good to uh, repeat and repeat uh, that. Um, you know, Bill was uh, absolutely right uh, in reminding that uh, my uh, um, story uh, with uh, uh, this place, uh, with the Monterey Institutes, goes into uh, 25 uh, years ago. But for the purpose of this presentation, by pure coincidence, uh, my story with Iran also goes back uh, 25 years. I was a reporter at Moskovsky Novosti Moscow News are working uh, with uh, the uh, so-called Kremlin uh, group uh, uh, of um, President Yeltsin and uh, the Russian government uh, when in 1992 uh, I was uh, invited by uh, the Minister of Nuclear uh, Energy at those times, Viktor uh, Mikhailov, uh, who was sharing with me uh, as a reporter, though of the record, which by itself was a little bit confusing for a young reporter, uh, and tempting as well, uh, <laughs> uh, Iranian uh, propositions uh, to Russia in nuclear uh, energy, which was a big, big shopping uh, list. And, uh, of course, uh, at that time, uh, I didn't know that much what Newton gas centrifuges meant and so on and so forth, but thanks uh, to the educational work of the Monterey Institute uh, and of the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, step by step, I learned uh, more. Uh, but throughout all those years, uh, my own interest, uh, research interest in Iran, both nuclear-related and not necessarily nuclear related uh, uh, has been staying uh, there. And uh, I was pleased uh, that uh, throughout very dark uh, years uh, of uh, West-Iran uh, relationship, or particularly uh, in the early um, uh, to, uh, well, basically through the whole uh, uh, to the uh, first decade of the uh, 2000s, I was maybe among those very few people who was advocating non-military diplomatic uh, solutions over Iranian uh, nuclear uh, program and around 2011-2012 uh, uh, was involved in uh, discussions with my American colleagues who finally under new Obama administration uh, got uh, interested in direct uh, discussions with Iran. Uh, today we will not be speaking necessarily about Iranian nuclear program or about JCPOA. We will not be able to avoid it. Uh, I will provide some ideas uh, through uh, the Russian lens and uh, my uh, own lens. Uh, but I know that you will have here um, Colonel Ferruzza, who will speak on the uh, IA and JCPOA. Oh, and uh, so uh, definitely uh, <laughs> this is not the main uh, subject of my presentation. But this guy helped me just uh, a few uh, days ago uh, because uh, he uh, very nicely, probably knowing that I will speak in Monterey <laughs> on this topic, uh, went uh, with his um, official visit to uh, Tehran uh, and uh, probably uh, made uh, this question mark a little bit smaller. Uh, but uh, there is still uh, a question mark of what it means uh, Iran uh, as a strategic uh, partner uh, for Russia. And again, I hear will speak not advocating uh, Iran and not for, through Iranian lens and not uh, advocating Russia's uh, government policy, but more trying to digest uh, what already goes on and what uh, actually may 
happen here on the scene. I will start uh, with a few, let's say, uh, official uh, descriptions so that we know we are officially Russia and Iran uh, stand currently uh, after uh, President Putin's meeting with uh, both uh, Iranian president and with Iranian Akbar. Uh, and uh, also uh, then uh, we will take a look at the shape of uh, economic uh, relationship uh, briefly between uh, the two uh, countries. Uh, and then we come uh, to uh, that juicy situation uh, that uh, President Trump uh, helped us with uh, on the 15th of uh, October, decertifying a comprehensive uh, plan of action, as we know as a JCP. Uh, OA and what it means for Russia and for Russian-Iranian relations, not what it means for the U.S. domestic policy, because then we we'll probably need to lock ourselves here in this room mm -hmm. for a few uh, more hours and have really strong drinks just to uh, digest <laughs> Washington for me these days, probably digesting Moscow uh, behavior and planning would be a really an easy uh, task compared to looking uh, into the Washington uh, inside. For the last two decades, Russian official doctrinal documents have always been saying a, the same or similar phrase about Russian-Iranian cooperation. Uh, the words could be slightly different, but the meaning always was the same. Iran is a difficult partner of Russia, but Iran is either a strategic partner of Russia in the Middle East and the surrounding areas, or the key strategic partner of Russia there. And this is probably important to look at that one off partner, strategic partners, or the key partner, but not to question uh, of the fact of recognition that partnership. In that sense, my question mark in the beginning probably is uh, just you know, for attracting attention for discussion, but factually it is not correct. There is a statement uh, that uh, Iran and Russia are strategic partners, at least from the Russian uh, viewpoint. Uh, prior to his uh, visit to Tehran uh, in March of this year, uh, President Putin just came back uh, to uh, this uh, idea indicating both reliability of Iranian partnership and stability, which is something new because uh, you can call Iran uh, a partner, strategic partner, but reliable partner. Well, uh, it was not uh, always the case, believe me. Uh, and uh, of course, good neighbor is also important. Iran is also neighbor to the United States because it borders uh, U.S. military bases uh, and uh, U.S. troops here and there uh, from um, uh, Iraq to uh, the uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, but for Russia, it is a neighbor in uh, all traditional senses of that word through the uh, Caspian uh, Sea. Uh, and uh, this is uh, just, uh, I would say, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my good uh, friend uh, uh, Mehdi Sami, uh, Iranian ambassador to Moscow and one of the most knowledgeable uh, Iranians of the Russian uh, culture, uh, he uh, came up with this statement uh, on his Facebook page. And actually, uh, it's always fun to exchange uh, ideas with Iranian colleagues and friends through our uh, American invented social network, <laughs> uh, which is uh, another reality of uh, a globalized uh, world. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mehdi uh, just stated um, uh, <coughs> on his uh, Facebook partnership, and it was just in preparation for President Putin's visit. I guess. Partnership with Russia for Iran was an option. <clears throat> Currently, it is a necessity. I think he clearly said what he wanted to uh, say here. And uh, here is what we have just a few 
uh, days uh, ago uh, in uh, Tehran. Uh, President uh, Putin uh, indicated uh, generally the productive work uh, with uh, Iran, uh, including on such a strategic issue as uh, Syria. And Iranians, of course, are called not only partners, by friends uh, here. But of course, you can also realize that by the end of your official visit, you normally need to be polite to your uh, host. Uh, uh, and um, President Rouhani uh, went uh, further indicating commitment of Iran to further strengthening of relations with Russia including of advanced cooperation on peace and security matters. Here you read more on sales, of course, uh, <laughs> and more cooperation on Syria uh, between uh, these lines. If I just for a minute uh, keep that strategic issues on hold and come back to that, you know, pros of a trade between the neighbors and the good neighbor. Uh, then probably the picture would not be as impressive as one could expect it to be after that introduction of the strategic partnership. All the target figures of Russian-Iranian trade uh, never were met. Nothing like, you know, our expectations of tens of uh, billions of dollars. Very very modest level of trade with all those Russian exports here, although growing, of course, as the JCPOA entered into force in January 2016, you see this growth. Russian companies, whatever independent they are, they look at uh, American behavior and uh, they don't want to enter in the friendly but swampy uh, places uh, like uh, Iran without uh, a clear signal uh, that sanctions over uh, Iran uh, have been removed. Uh, and uh, of course, um, a very uh, a small uh, levels uh, of uh, Iranian uh, trade coming into Russia, and mostly these are pistachio. Uh, business, which is nice to have Iranian pistachios in uh, Russian supermarkets, but which are peanuts, basically compared to what could be done uh, in the uh, bilateral uh, trade. Uh, and of course, uh, figures for uh, the first uh, half of the year uh, should not be sorry that these are just a very initial uh, figures. We uh, should not uh, use them as uh, any indicators, so I better look at it here. Yes, uh, clear uh, growth uh, in uh, trade uh, on the Russian side, but still very, very modest relation. To be very clear, uh, the trade patterns uh, and these figures do not include arms sales, and they do not include nuclear cooperation, where, of course, uh, there is much better potential uh, than you can see it here. Uh, if you extract those figures, which uh, you will not find exact figures, only uh, generalities, uh, you can find uh, that uh, basically uh, throughout the uh, sectors there is a trade uh, uh, in uh, agriculture, which goes on uh, in mineral products uh, coming uh, from Russia and uh, metals, and a certain increase are in the year 2016 in machinery and uh, equipment uh, exports uh, from uh, Russia uh, to uh, Iran, uh, while, as I told you, in case of uh, Iran, this is mostly food and agricultural uh, stuff. So two neighbors across the Caspian basically doing very little. There is some uh, trade uh, between uh, the neighboring uh, regions uh, with the Russian uh, regions of Astrakhan, with Dagestan, but it's not that much. Now, when we look closer uh, into the specific sectors either reflected in the previous charts or not at all, 
we clearly see the dominance uh, of the nuclear uh, factor in a bilateral, if you like, economic strategic, economic slash strategic uh, relationship. Uh, I remember it well, and uh, Professor Potter uh, reminded us um, uh, about um, you know, the Peer Center's publication, Yadern in Control. I remember how uh, as early as in 1995, I was publishing there an article by uh, David Fisher uh, then from uh, IAEA, uh, who very bravely uh, supported the Russian deal with Iran on building the nuclear power plant in Bushehr. Uh, to be very frank, he was probably the only uh, non-Russian, and actually there were very few Russians, <laughs> who were publicly <laughs> supportive uh, to uh, that deal at the moment. There were immense pressures by uh, the Clinton administration on Russia, uh, on Bushir and uh, on uh, other elements uh, of um, cooperation, nuclear and so-called military technical cooperation, uh, as well uh, as uh, there were clear uh, pressures uh, from uh, Israel uh, and reluctance of certain Russian potential partners, particularly Ukraine, uh, to uh, work as a joint venture uh, with uh, Russia on building a Bushehr nuclear power plant. But finally, we got Bushehr 1 after many delays. Some of them were technical, most of them were purely political. Uh, and uh, now we go further after uh, appearance uh, of the uh, first uh, nuclear uh, power plant uh, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, fully uh, operational and uh, built uh, by Rosatom. Uh, the plants are uh, developed uh, here uh, into um, construction of uh, two uh, new units uh, on a Boucher a nuclear power plant, which in fact started in March uh, of this year, units two and units three, which go uh, up to 2020. Uh, uh, six and of course a very general uh, estimate uh, of uh, that contract is uh, 10 billion uh, US uh, dollars. Uh, and uh, things uh, go further of course uh, on uh, the Russian uh, participation practically uh, and the uh, JCPOA uh, with modification of uh, cascades of gas centrifuges at uh, for the, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, is very important Russian, I would say, uh, investment, if you like, uh, into uh, the uh, JCPOA uh, by itself. Uh, switching from uh, nuclear to the stuff which may be less familiar for uh, the colleagues at the James Martin Center, but which is certainly uh, very well uh, studied by. Uh, everybody who follows Russian-Iranian uh, relations and all developments in the region. The issue which was very high on President Putin's uh, agenda in Tehran, and of course uh, there was also a trilateral meeting uh, in uh, Iran uh, when uh, Azerbaijani uh, president was uh, participating. This is uh, the uh, north-south transportation uh, corridor. Uh, coming uh, through uh, India, uh, from India to uh, Iran, uh, into uh, Russia, and uh, then uh, Western uh, uh, Europe. Uh, this is a very ambitious plan, which really makes uh, the transportation of goods are uh, two weeks, if not more, are uh, quicker uh, than uh, without it. Uh, mostly uh, it has been uh, developed and we expect basically uh, by uh, the end uh, of uh, this year uh, to uh, have it from uh, the uh, trial stage uh, to uh, the practical stage. Russian Railways uh, is uh, active uh, in uh, Iran uh, as well, although at this moment there are more MOUs uh, rather than uh, implementation uh, of uh, the contracts. But Russia altogether is quite active and plans to be even more actively 
uh, involved in uh, transportation um, uh, projects uh, in uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, uh, one of the Russian uh, state corporations, uh, state oligarchic structures, if you like, uh, Transnet, uh, uh, has been involved uh, in a, a very interesting uh, new uh, project. This is something uh, which uh, took place very recently in June 2007. One of the uh, uh, companies within the structure of Transnet, region Transnet, acquired ownership of airfield complex in a place called Kum. Again, again not unfamiliar for those studying Iran, but for completely uh, uneconomic uh, reasons, of course, uh, home base uh, of uh, Iranian uh, Ayatollahs. Uh, and Russian company has become the uh, sole owner of the uh, territory and the uh, facilities are there to be uh, continued. Uh, on the non-nuclear energy uh, sector, uh, you see quite a number of activities involving Gazprom and uh, associated uh, companies, although not uh, limited to Gazprom and uh, clearly uh, a very important uh, element uh, of uh, potential involvement of major uh, energy players in Russia like uh, Novatek uh, uh, here. Uh, so some of those companies who were waiting and looking and not necessarily brave enough uh, to say, okay, we're not here about uh, sanctions all the way around, they did care and now uh, they went uh, full speed, either almost full speed, uh, but uh, clearly quicker uh, than before uh, into uh, Iranian uh, markets. And uh, President Putin's visa definitely supported that. Uh, this is area which sometimes slips uh, out uh, of uh, attention of the observers. Iran is one of those markets which uh, has been very actively integrated in the global telecommunications, uh, but uh, people in Iran want more and more and more to be uh, connected with the world. Plus, of course, uh, this is impressive young uh, population who wants to be with the social media, not with one cell phone, but with two. Uh, so all those trends you see elsewhere uh, in Iran, probably people are even more uh, starving now for that. Uh, and uh, this is in the hands, of course, of the Russian government here, uh, who gives the signal to the Russian private uh, entities to deal or not to deal with uh, Iran. A Russian Ministry of uh, Communications uh, signed uh, an MOU on IT and communications with uh, Iranian uh, partners. Uh, although a uh, Russian major uh, state company, Ross Telecom, had already an agreement on cooperation with Iran active since 2011. Uh, Beeline, uh, our company, uh, which uh, with very uh, strong connections with the Middle East, most particularly with Israel, because its stakeholders are mostly Israeli uh, uh, citizens, has a lot of partners uh, in uh, Iran uh, already for uh, roaming as well as one more Russian company, Megaphone, and some of the Russian IT players, more in the area of, I would say, uh, hurt uh, security of IT. Uh, they do participate in providing cyber defense for Islamic Republic of uh, Iran. Of course, uh, you know Kaspersky Lab, who has been involved uh, in uh, helping Iran both with Stuxnet, post-Stuxnet uh, uh, traumas, uh, but uh, going beyond that. Uh, but there are other Russian uh, companies uh, who are involved here in uh, supporting of Iranian, let's call them cyber projects, whatever it may uh, mean here. And uh, here on the screen, uh, you see uh, uh, that really, uh, well, some of the examples of uh, the uh, Russian-Iranian of partnerships uh, on the Internet, of the Internet of Things. Uh, although we have uh, actually a downside of that, a uh, couple of Russian uh, 
uh, resources uh, are uh, blocked by uh, Iranian uh, authorities uh, because uh, of their, as they believe, non-Islamic and non-discreet uh, nature. But I don't think much political here. And actually, as far as I know, quite a number of people in the Middle East, including Iranians, use Telegram, uh, the uh, uh, service uh, established by a Russian will now not necessarily uh, Russian based. So uh, after a few of these uh, ideas for you on where uh, Russia and Iran stand in the economic uh, field, <coughs> at least in some uh, areas uh, of um, economic uh, cooperation, I skipped here uh, military technical uh, cooperation, um, we can look a little bit uh, at uh, how Russia views Iran from the sense uh, of geopolitics and uh, Middle East uh, geopolitics uh, specific, more specifically. Uh, there are uh, three colors used here on this map. And I need to explain what means what, uh, so to avoid any uh, confusion. Uh, in this uh, blue, right, uh, we have uh, those countries which, in accordance with Russian views, though not necessarily you would find it in the official uh, documents, are viewed as Russian main strategic pillars in the region of uh, the uh, Middle East and Maghreb. So in Russia's view, there are three major pillars in the region that Russia uh, should are uh, viewed as uh, most important ones. Is that Iran, Egypt, and Syria. And Syria, of course, here is that weak link which Russia believes it's important to strengthen. But here you will see the fourth pillar, and it would be completely unfair to ignore it. Russian Israeli relationship, including strategic relationship, is currently unprecedented. I don't think any decision in Moscow on Middle Eastern issues, including Syria, is made without at least consulting with Israeli uh, colleagues. Uh, and uh, certainly this goes beyond just sharing certain views of counter-terrorism. This goes to key element of strategic visions, including, by the way, US-Russian uh, relations. Uh, Netanyahu can open President Putin's doors in unprecedentedly uh, easy way showing up uh, in Moscow uh, in uh, the afternoon and in the evening already uh, having a meeting with Putin outside uh, Moscow. Uh, so Israel here should not be discounted, although it looks a little bit awkward in this uh, composition, but uh, it is not. Uh, and uh, Algeria, though not central for our discussion, is uh, traditionally a consumer of uh, the Russian arms and traditionally is viewed as an important Russian strategic uh, partner uh, in the Middle East and relatively stable compared to certain other elements. This uh, pink uh, or purple, whatever, <laughs> Uh, you uh, have this color uh, for. Uh, these are somewhere in between. They're not strategic partners. They may be even troublemakers at a certain point. But this is something where Russia sees potential to improve relations with. And these countries are quite different, and uh, each story is very different. Our uh, discussion at the seminar is not about that, so I will just uh, use a second for H, which may be unfair. Uh, Oman uh, clearly played uh, a crucial role uh, as a silent, uh, silent mediator uh, between Americans and uh, Iranians in preparation for the open phase of the uh, JCPOA. Russia views Oman as an important stabilizer in the whole region, particularly if uh, the times change from our uh, times of uncertainty to times of clear uh, trouble here. With the United Arab Emirates, Russia has a lot uh, of strategic and financial connections, some 
Russians do believe that Dubai is actually part of the Russian Federation uh, because of just uh, active travels there. More importantly, uh, Russian uh, government uh, sees uh, Abu Dhabi uh, as uh, an interesting and at times very useful interlocutor. And in recent times, the relationship between Russia and Qatar changed dramatically from hostile over Syria to very intimate on a number of fronts, which is not completely alien to Russian-Iranian dialogue on the region. Uh, and with Turkey, you probably know uh, the uh, story uh, here of the ups and downs of the relationship. Uh, we in Moscow do not have those illusions that with Turkey uh, we can uh, establish just peaceful, rosy, and uh, zero problem relationship. But it is believed uh, that uh, Russian-Turkish healthy and good uh, relationship is key to the balancing of the Russian position in the whole region. So basically, uh, Iran, uh, Egypt, Syria, and uh, Israel, well, may, maybe not Syria as it is in war, but Iran, Egypt, and Israel would not be sufficient here for the Russian clear presence in the region uh, without uh, Turkey. As Fiona Hill uh, had written, I think, about 15 years ago, if not uh, earlier than that, uh, that inevitably Russia and Turkey would come closer to each other. Her forecast, at least in that particular case, really is becoming true though through a difficult uh, uh, fashion. And this uh, red color, the only country in the region which is viewed by Russia, again, I'm uh, just giving you a translation from the official language into the practicalities. You will not find it in official languages, I guess, as the key troublemaker, as the main headache for Russia, and as the main rival of Russia and Russia's interest in of the region. Having said that, the idea is the more we pressure on Saudi Arabia, the better result would be. Uh, and oops, uh, there was King of Saudi Arabia uh, who stopped uh, in Moscow very recently, and investment uh, contracts signed between Russia and Saudi Arabia surprised even uh, the optimists uh, about uh, the bilateral relationship, which again proved that Russian believe that with the Saudis there is the only way of talk with a stick. Uh, and we, we, we will see now that uh, all this uh, difficult uh, case also on the decision making uh, in the Kenya. Our cooperation on Syria between Russia and Iran. I always uh, been told in different US uh, audiences in particular, as well in some Europeans as well, how can you talk about serious Russian-Iranian cooperation over Syria? Russia and uh, Iran have completely different strategic uh, goals in uh, Syria. I not necessarily would agree with that. What I would agree with that Russian interests are Russian interests, which shouldn't play for Iranian tunes uh, on Syria. And the Iranians definitely do not uh, play uh, over uh, Russian uh, tunes uh, there, having uh, their own uh, interests uh, clearly uh, in the country. But I myself have been impressed how in the last two, two and a half years, the uh, ideas of uh, working together on Syria between Russia and Iran, specifically mill to mill, from words, from intentions, materialized into practical cooperation uh, in the field. And of course, this is not uh, limited uh, for uh, use uh, of the uh, Hamadan uh, air base uh, in uh, Iran uh, for Iran Iranians themselves for domestic purposes. This, uh, this is a serious uh, and sensitive issue, so not necessarily uh, they uh, make uh, these issues uh, public, nor Russia. 
a lot of Russian-Iranian mill-to-mill relationship goes completely off the radar. I remember uh, when uh, Hussein De Khan, uh, Iranian defense minister, came uh, to Moscow in May uh, 2015. 2015. He sent a message that Iran is looking at different formats of working with Russia militarily in the Middle East, in particular. In May 2016, he already came with a different message. We are there, we are ready, let's just sit together, our general staffs, our practitioners, our operations uh, people, and let us just clean Syria off the terrorists and return the land uh, to uh, the uh, Syrian uh, government uh, of uh, Bashar Assad. And uh, whatever uh, the way uh, it was communicated to uh, our Israeli partners, of course, Russia has been communicating these issues to a certain level to the Israeli partners as well. Again, as I told you, this is not a lecture about Iranian nuclear program. This is just a re friendly reminder that, yes, we have this issue, and uh, that for quite a number of uh, years, <coughs> Russia was not only involved in uh, construction of nuclear power plant in uh, southern uh, Iran uh, in Bushir, but also had its backs and forth with other elements of nuclear cooperation. Uh, I started with uh, my uh, memories uh, of uh, Minister Viktor Mikhailov, who was discussing with me uh, ideas uh, for, uh, from Iran uh, for contracts with Russia. In 1994, it went further when uh, Minister Mikhailov, and I was not there, uh, he went to Tehran and signed a protocol of intention with uh, Iran, including um, providing Iran with the gas uh, centrifuges from Russia, an unprecedented level of uh, training for Iranian students in Moscow. Uh, that document became known to uh, U.S. colleagues and through them became known to President uh, Yeltsin, which was, of course, uh, a shame for the Russian uh, policy. Nothing happened on that side. And Russia was always very carefully watching Iran. So here we have basically two trends which have been working, I would say, hand in hand in most cases. On the one hand, yes, Russia wants its presence strategically and commercially in Iran with the uh, civilian nuclear sector built by, by Russia. And moreover, to prove to the whole Middle East that Russia is not only talking, Russia is delivering, even under a difficult uh, political uh, circumstances, sometimes close to impossible. On the other hand, there have been all this proliferation concern. With all that strategic partnership, Iranians were cheaters. Iranians were cheaters not only to others, but also to Russians with all that friendship involved. Uh, they were hiding from Russia significant elements of their clandestine uh, <coughs> program, including non-peaceful elements of that program, which led Russia to believe uh, that we should trust but verify. <laughs> all that the saying even not necessarily trust the ratings, but verify very closely what we are doing and not because it was Israel or United States who requested Russia to do so, but because of the Russian own national interest. Russia never ever wanted Iran with nuclear weapons. Russia does not want Iran with nuclear weapons. Russia has been doing and will be doing everything possible through different means to prevent Iran from any attempt to work on clandestine or whatever non-peaceful uh, nuclear program, because we believe it goes against core Russian national interests. 
Oh, this is why we were not jealous at all. We were helpful to the extent we could to put uh, Iranians and Americans under uh, the, the palms uh, in Muscat. It was not our business, uh, uh, and it was bilateral uh, US-Iranian business. Uh, and later on, uh, come to uh, Geneva and other uh, places uh, to work through uh, the uh, agreement what has become a comprehensive plan of action. And Russia here, of course, supported discussion and the development step-by-step -step approach to the solution of Iranian nuclear program both with technical expertise, technical involvement, and political support. For those of you who could just not notice that the uh, JCPOA was concluded in 2015, how could we come through these months of new Cold War between Russia and the United States, the crisis of Ukraine, and not damage the future JCPOA only because Russia strongly believed uh, that non-proliferation or uh, nuclear non-proliferation and arrangements over uh, Iranian nuclear programs are vital to her irregardless of US behavior over Ukraine. This is a good lesson but it cannot be applied to every situation. It was applied specifically to that situation. And now I come into just the final uh, slides uh, that uh, bring me uh, to uh, the uh, current uh, situation uh, over the JCPOA as we see it uh, in Russia. Of course, there are a number of remaining issues over the Iranian <laughs> nuclear program which do not prevent Russian Iranian further nuclear. Uh, cooperation, but we have to register them. Uh, uh, the most critical one is implementation of the JCPOA provisions by all of the parties. In uh, Iran's view, United States has not been implementing the JCPOA because of clear threats uh, to Iran and, uh, of course, uh, the most recent event decertification of the JCPOA by President Trump on uh, October uh, 15. What would, uh, what would it mean for the next few months and uh, maybe for the dynamics in the region, for the dynamics of Russia's behavior in the region, but also for uh, Russia's uh, behavior uh, globally? There are here four scenarios of which I think all of us uh, are quite well uh, aware of. Scenario A, some think uh, that Trump may have some secret cards and may already uh, discussing uh, some additional deal with Iran, maybe on missile stuff, uh, maybe on regional issues uh, that could uh, help him show that he can deliver and improve what he uh, said many times was a, a terrible, horrible uh, Obama-made uh, deal. Uh, sounds good, though completely uh, misleading. I can not know some things, but at least to my knowledge and to my analysis, uh, this is completely misleading a way uh, to think that this scenario can be a reality or is a, a reality. Uh, even if we pretend to think uh, that uh, some discussions between Americans and Iranians currently go on, we do know uh, that reaching agreements, uh, separate arrangements on regional security issues would be impossible uh, in uh, the near future. On the missiles, maybe we will not uh, see problems here on the Russian side. We just do not see any intention from the Iranian side uh, to look uh, closer into that linking 
it with the currently existing G CPOA, which uh, is already mutually uh, agreed uh, document. Scenario B, uh, Trump is bluffing. Well, maybe not much uh, of a surprise. <coughs> Iran calls it his bluff. European parties of the GCPOA, as well as Russia uh, and uh, China, as well as US Congress, are basically <coughs> positive on uh, the GCPOA. In case of European partners, Russia and China, uh, this is clearly what goes on. US Congress question mark. Uh, here, for Trump, it's good. He saves his face with the certification. Congress does nothing, and uh, the deal still is fragile but survives. Uh, for those of us in Moscow who just <coughs> see the situation currently, this is what we are currently told by the Europeans. Look, we work with Congress so much, Congress will keep silent after 60 days, nothing will happen. Okay, good. Uh, I, 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 I see uh, it uh, positive news if uh, the deal uh, is uh, uh, saved and uh, survives. Uh, but clearly, that fragility and not necessarily the sustainability of the Iran deal, uh, this is would uh, worry me uh, anyway. Although if Congress here plays a silently a positive role and silently supporting the deal without hurting it, uh, I would say it's uh, definitely as a, a good development. Uh, scenario C, uh, Trump uh, is bluffing here. Uh, Iran decides to ignore uh, his antics so as to save at least some part of the deal. United States pulls out of the JCPOA with Congress adding uh, more sanctions, so it can be not necessarily de jure, but uh, de facto pulling out of the JCPOA. But Russia, China, and Europeans, as well as Iran itself, remain. Uh, for Iran, it seems like uh, it is a nice thing as well. He looks like a hero, uh, but uh, here we have a very significant trap. Uh, some of our European colleagues in particular, as well as some of our American colleagues, do believe that this is a good working scenario. So if B doesn't work, C is okay. Uh, even without the United States, Iran will be somehow glued with the deal and with transparency and with uh, full cooperation with IAEA. In ideal world, that would sound good. The world is not ideal. From what I see, from what I hear, from my discussions with my Iranian colleagues as well as with others, this will not happen. Iran needs United States clearly in the deal, in a, uh, the more sustainable way possible. It will not be sufficient for Iran to see Europeans only in the deal. So just, uh, we should not, uh, in my view, make uh, mistakes uh, here. And uh, the uh, final option, uh, the option uh, D, uh, when uh, we see uh, that uh, you know, new uh, sanctions uh, are uh, imposed on Iran and the deal clearly collapses. And whatever Europeans do, whatever IAEA again states uh, in uh, defense of the deal, actually, uh, Director General Zamano's statement was a very strong one in support uh, of the deal, the game of the JCPOA and all the architecture uh, many of us tried to build in uh, the recent years will uh, collapse. Our, even more, not only the Iran deal will collapse, not only Iranians will play their wild cards uh, <coughs> to dissatisfaction uh, both of international community, both my country uh, as well, now, this will be a clear signal that multilateral diplomacy simply does not work. Any agreements, any arrangements reaching whatever climate of good spirit are only ghosts and 
uh, can be sacrificed with any new administration of the United States uh, coming into the White House. For me, as a practitioner, this is also a big question. How can we say to North Koreans, yes, there can be a deal with you guys, when the deal which already exists uh, can uh, be uh, destroyed? So to conclude, we're in Moscow, are all very worried about the state uh, of, of the uh, Iran deal, of the JCPOA. We do not believe uh, that uh, just by uh, saying uh, that, okay, we can muddle through it, we will muddle through it. The things could just slide down and down uh, if uh, Washington uh, would uh, continue behaving uh, that way as it uh, behaved. Some may tell me, egoistically, it may be good for Russia. Russia would get <coughs> even bigger markets, even less competition uh, in uh, Iran. Uh, my concluding message here would be, it would be as devastating for Russia as uh, for uh, the uh, whole regional situation in the Middle East and for the whole our international uh, security architecture. We should try to do all our best, all of us who can, to avoid that specific scenario. Thank you.